barbecue clothing on? And I was like, yes. Wow. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for joining me in my shenanigans. Anyway, um, so the predominant factor in all of our soil is sand, right? So we won't go to the corner that says clay and we won't go to the corner that says silt because truly that's not the overwhelming factor in our soil and then we navigate on out, right? The overwhelming factor in our soil is sand. And so then it said, what are the four major texture classes in our soil? Well then, there's plain old sand, right? Because we do have ocean front and that really is just sand. And just because we are not actively growing something in it doesn't mean that something isn't actively growing in it, right? So we've got a lot of um, beach restoration and dune restoration and dune preservation projects going on. And they're all growing things in plain old sand out there. Right, so sea oats. I just like feeling the sea oats. Never tried eating it. Don't think we should, but I'm just, I'm a weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> I like the plants. I never plant. thought of eating And them. railroad <laughs> vine and, you know, so those are things that are going in just plain old sand. Moving up from there, we have loamy sand which means then that we've got a little bit of bigger particles and some organic matter that, that's in there, something decayed amongst the sand. So, and then we have sandy loam, right? But, but the, the thread going through all of this is still sand. And then we've got sandy clay loam. We don't really have anything that's plain old loam here because that doesn't have any word in it that pertains to sand, that's immediately eliminated. All right, so every category here that has the word sand in it, you've got a winner. Plain sand and sand that has a little bit, bit of other things in it is where you're gonna go with that, okay? Um, it's important for us to know what soil has up to 30% clay in it. What difference will the clay make? Yes. It, and it pretends that it's a rock, right? When you get that sand and that clay and that loam put together, it pretends like it's a rock until pressure hits it. You can break it up with a, with a hammer. Right, you can put it through the, the grinder and then you'll know whether or not you really have real rock or not. But it, there are people who walk in and say, well, my yard is all rock. Not really, not really. What you might have is some soil that has a lot of clay in it, a significant, significantly more than these other three types you have. Why do I want you all to know what the soil types are here? You know what to grow where? Yes. We, we need to know what people are working with. And we need to be able to discuss with people what they're working with. Because not everybody's going to build a raised bed system like I had out at the garden, right? And not everything I'm growing out there is going to be in that sort of a raised bed system. And what's underneath that raised bed? Loamy sand. That's what I've got. It's a lot more of the sand that has some loam in it, okay? That's important for us to know. And how big, and when we talk about textures, um, and when we're talking about the characteristics, it's how would you describe this soil, right? How would you describe the feel of it? How would you describe the size of the particles? So a lot of this, because of that sand, you're talking about a very large particle. You can see sand in your hand, right? You can separate one sand grain from another in your hand, right? Can't do that with clay. You can throw loam up in the air and you know, and you can see it in the sunlight and whatnot, but yeah, make sure that you're not going downwind. You know what I mean? So 
how does the size of the sand particle make a difference in when you're gardening here? Drainage, the water goes through. Water goes way through it. It just goes through. How does that sand particle feel in your hand? The technical language is coarse, right? It's coarse. Clay, especially when it is mostly clay, you can just rub it and it like makes a ribbon, right? That's why we use it for our pottery making. You can mold it. You can just do all sorts of things with it. It's really nice and fine and it holds together very well. Silt is, is a little bit more friable. It's a little bit more crumbly, but it will hold together if you just leave it alone. But sand, sand does not care about our feelings. It's going to fracture, it is going to break apart, it is just going to do what it feels like doing. So when we talk about water management, when we explain to people what it is that they're working with in their landscapes and why we recommend covering the soil with mulch to help reduce the amount of, not just evaporation, right, but the mulch when it breaks down, the organic matter will also help to hold water in place. When I teach people about how they use fertilizer, I really go ahead on deeper into the idea of when you're using fertilizer, you need to make sure that it is staying where it needs to stay because where is all liquid going? Into the lagoon, right? That's where it's gonna go. And I said liquid because people are changing their oil on their driveways and they're not using things to mitigate where that oil is going to run off into. There's nothing wrong with changing your oil in your driveway. There's something wrong with leaving it, any spills there on the driveway. There's nothing wrong with fertilizing your plants. There's something wrong if that fertilizer does not remain where your plants can use it. That's the problem, right? Sand, if you all have ever been through new toll plazas before they have it all set up and you see the cars just running through it, running through it, running through it, that's sand. Clay is like when there's a huge backup on the turnpike and you've got miles and miles of people waiting to drop in their money. And silt is a reasonable morning just past rush hour where you, you've got a little bit of stopping to do, but not that much. We have sand, folks. So when we discuss using fertilizers or any other chemical additives to the soil, we need to help people understand that the sand does not care. It's going to let everything pass it by. Hence the reason why we encourage people to manage their soil, add, enrich it with organic matter, do different things, grow your plants properly so that those root systems can get out and be as fibrous as they want to be and hold the soil together because sand, it will not hold one another. They don't cling to one another at all. And it also does not cling, the water does not cling to it. The surface is too big, all right? The water is like, eh, doesn't like me, I don't like it, it's fine. We coexist for as long as I have to be here. Not so with the clay and not so with the silty loam. Now, of course, I have a place in Alabama and my yard is mostly red clay. So I have an opposite condition that I have to manage, right? And so I plant things that are going to break up that clay and give it more pore space and, and, and allow more roots to get down in there and do what it would like to do. And silt, some people think that silt is a dream until they get it in their clothing. Then they're like, yeah, I'm going to head on back to Florida. Sand washes out pretty reasonably and well, you know, but silt is something that you're going to find more and more in the places where, according to some scientists, you've got millions of years of, of organic matter accumulating on, on the surface of the soil and all that has been allowed to happen with that is water from either rains or snow sat on top of it, broke it down really, really well, and you've got really awesome soil that you're working in. Um, one of you is from somewhere in the middle of the country. You. Iowa. 
Iowa. Yes, you all have loamy soil. That it, their soil is like seven, eight percent organic matter. When you compare that to what we have here in Florida, you're looking at not even two percent in many, many places here. So their soil is going to hold water at the roots of your plants and your plants are going to have nutrients that can sit there and do what it needs to do. And it's unlikely that the soil is going to let those things wash on by, right? In Alabama, there are lots of chicken processing plants, which then you've got to sit down and say, hmm, chicken farms, processing plants, there's a lot of chicken poop. And you would think, that because the clay seems to be impermeable, that we don't have water table problems. We do. For several months out of the year, those places have to sequester their chicken poop until the rain season has passed. And then they spread it out, they make sure it gets dry, and they send it off to fertilizer plants. They can't just let the chicken poop just sit out there or they can't just pump it out and drop it down because that is a lot of phosphorus. And chicken poop is not something that you can just throw straight into your garden. It has to compost on out. So that's all hot nutrients, basically, that they have to sequester, even though the clay should help, or in theory, the clay should create its own barrier it doesn't, not necessarily for that. It, the chicken poop will wash off of the clay and into the water. Ain't that something? <laughs> yeah, I thought so myself. There is, um, there are a couple of very, very small farmers and they're still doing this project where they are raising chickens in fields where there are um, plants that are developed, that are, that are, planted specifically to break down into the clay, clay busting plants that dig their roots deep down. And when you pull them up, you've got really nice, aerable, friable soil. So what they're doing is they're trying to raise their chickens in areas with that to see if then the poop travels down instead of just washing off so that farmers have more options, but we're not in Alabama. Um, having said that, we are here in Florida and you all are in Master Gardener training class. So um, let me take this one down and come back to this. I know, I know. I just need to remember to hit the button that says switch. I really do. All right. Indian River Soil and Water Conservation District. Where is it located? Here. Upstairs in our office. <laughs> Linda, who was gone to lunch when we went up there the other day, is the um, secretary, and she um, she works with several of the board members. Several of them are really, really reasonable people. <laughs> um, and then there are a few of them who I do not have too many conversations with. My conversations or exchanges, I should say, with them are hello. Goodbye. <laughs> but that is a personal opinion about the person. When I come down here and I attend, I just listen in on some of their meetings and hear what it is that they're doing and what and how things are going. So one of the things that um, you will notice on their website is what is it that they do? And mostly what they do pertains to private property, right? Most of the things that they try to influence is what is happening on private property. Why is that important? Well, if you have a lot of private property and they're doing um, things with fertilizers they shouldn't be doing, it's going to affect public property. And, and what else? The yes, it's going to affect the lagoon. But um, one of the biggest deals to ever happen with, with um, regards to private property, which are, which you'll hear the buzzword property rights. Yes. So it was a huge issue um, 
maybe 20 years ago now, I think, or no, because Andrew was even before that, um, after that, so maybe 30 years now, um, was when somebody thought it would have been a brilliant idea to send tree cutters into people's personal residential yards. If you see a citrus tree, go in there and cut it down and give the person a 50 or $40 voucher and say, thanks. Wait, wait a minute. How dare you enter my private property and cut down my, my plant and then? And then, okay, so then they said, well, let's do a campaign to say to people, we'd like to come and cut down your plant. Here's some money to go get you something else but we're coming to cut down your plant. So take the money, we are coming to cut down your plant. And this was because of citrus canker, right? And, and it was happening. Like, honest to goodness, here comes the government workers in on people's private property, thanks for your tree, here's this thing, good deal. And then there were some gangsters in Broward County who said, say what? Who do you think you're doing this with? That lawsuit was magnificent. And they said, no, you are infringing on my rights, on my property rights. You don't get to come and tell me that because the citrus, commercial citrus is having a problem that I can't own citrus and you're coming to remove my citrus trees, especially with your untrained tree cutters just out here, just cutting down all sorts of trees, whether or not it has canker or not, whether or not it is a source of inoculum for canker or not, is not your business. If I wanna grow my unhealthy citrus tree in my yard that I paid for, I'm going to do it. And the court case raged on, of course, commercial agriculture growers um, had a lot of money into it and so did the people who backed private property rights and they won. And canker was almost completely eliminated in many, many areas in Florida, even with notwithstanding the lawsuit, um, giving people the right to say whether or not you could come and take away their citrus trees in order to save commercial citrus. And then Hurricane Andrew came through. And Andrew was very unique. Andrew did a really great job of wreaking havoc, but he also made sure that the dual directionality of his winds really covered the whole of Florida as well. So there are some times when hurricanes will hit you and you only got one direction of the wind. And by the time it, the, the other direction of the wind swings back, it's already so far away that that hits something else, right? Andrew did not do that. Andrew came through and he said, I'm smacking you in this direction and then I'm smacking you in that direction. And guess which directions he went? North and South. So he took, the canker that was left and he brushed it straight up Florida one direction and straight back down Florida in another direction. And canker came back in places where we had finally eliminated it just because we had these little pockets of canker left remaining and we could not legislate it and we could not do anything and say buzzing. So why am I telling you this? I'm telling you all this because with a little bit better education, with a little bit better thought and planning, we could have had people making these decisions, talking with residential customers and saying, hey, this is what we're trying to do. This is why it is important to the whole state of Florida that we do this. We're not saying you absolutely can't grow this. We're saying that we'd like for you to start over and we're giving you enough money to not get a fully mature tree, but a tree that will bear for you within another two years at least. 
work with us on this project, right? A little bit more information, a more nuanced conversation could have been had where people were not saying to themselves, how dare you cross reach my threshold? That's, that's, not, that's not your job. This is why I have a private piece of property, right? Anyway, um, so that, that is one of the things that I am always very interested in with when they have their meetings for the Soil and Water Conservation District that I listen in and I say to myself, so there's a person trying to run a real landscaping business from their residentially zoned acreage. And there are people who are up in arms about it. And they are getting blowback from two entities. The people who invested in commercial property to run a commercial business. And the residential people who are looking at all of this equipment and, and everything else that these people have there. The other commercial operators are saying they're not subjected to the things that we're subjected to being commercial operators. The residential clients um, complainers are saying, I just don't want this crap <laughs> being my view from my lanai. And I don't care if they've got 88 acres out there. I invested in my five or my 10 and that's not the view that I want to have. And that was, that's been something that's been um, raging. Um, there's another, um, there was another hot button issue where they, they had to weigh in and, and do the research and, and have the conversations on a person who was using biosolids. And basically it is just, excuse me, whatever is left after sewage goes through the water treatment plant. That's biosolid, that is biological solid waste, right? And this is what the microbes have not managed to eat in however many applicate and no matter how many um, iterations in one tank and then the next tank and the next tank. And then this is what runs off into the waterways. And this is what gets skimmed off because it is the solid material that is still left. Um, and by the time you get to that point, it is a very denatured thing, honestly. Um, but all the people in that residential area have an understanding of is they're spreading human poop in their yard and using it as fertilizer. Like, no, we don't want this. It's, it's not like, it's so not cool. Now, if this was a commercial farm, if this was a business doing this, then you can call in the EPA and you can call in the USDA and you can do all of those things, which I spent one day of my life taking soil and tissue samples on a hundred plots. So that was like, I want to say three, 400 acres of land. It was not me one. I don't have that kind of heart, y'all. It was the whole of extension. We shut down for the day and we were out there with the farmers on different buggies and it was three groups of us. We met for lunch and still had to go back out there again. And we finished up at about 6.30 in the evening. So it was great because they were spreading biosolids in their fields. And of course, this is the problem with Blue Cypress Lake. Not really. <laughs> and are they not doing the right mitigation practices? But when it comes to residential property, remember I told you all last week, People can over fertilize their turf anytime they feel like. They can they can go and buy seven bags of fertilizer and they need maybe two. And they can spread it on thick. And unless code enforcement people actually have a way to enforce the code, then the only thing that they really can do is say, you know, that's not the best practice. And that's it. So these people, you know, they get together, they discuss these things, and they try to give the best advice that they can on how to manage these private property questions. Um, the only other th major thing that I really wanted you all to um, pay attention to for right now is poison control. 
Why would I want you all to be able to know how to access poison control? Remember, I tell you that's what it is. Because there will be times when we're doing some sort of activity, some sort of thing. And I want you all to know that poison control is easy to access. And have that in the back of your mind that there is such a thing as poison control. They used to have commercials for poison control when I was a small child. And my mother really had to call them one day because I drank bleach. It was not on purpose. My mother was doing laundry. She poured some bleach into a cup and that happened to be my cup. And it kind of looked like lemonade. And I just assumed that she had poured me some lemonade, which was not unlike her. She might be deficient in some other things, but she would give me lemonade. My favorite thing in the world. Y'all even hear me talking about lemonade a lot. <laughs> um, and so I walked into the kitchen while she had her back turned and I took a huge gulp of bleach. And my mother grabbed the whole gallon of milk and the only thing she did not do was baptize me in it. <laughs> um, she called poison control and she has me drinking straight from the bottle, which was rather difficult, but I managed. And no matter how much I told her, I cannot drink another gulp. No, you've got to drink it down. My child drank bleach. And then she's wondering if she's going to go to jail because I drank bleach. <laughs> but it was fun. But the good thing was that we had the little number on our refrigerator door. And a lot of your chemical accidents happen in your kitchen. And guess where else? Your garden. Yeah. Your yard. Whatever, wherever it is that you have your chemicals for um, for lawn care, for garden care. That is something that happens a lot. Do you all know one of the one of the most fun, funny things that happens to people? They turn blue because of the nitrogen in their um, <laughs> in their fertilizer, and it's volatilizing in the hot shed that they store it in. And they're always going in and out of that hot shed. And so they get like this little blue tint on them. And that's when, you know, you run to the hospital and you're like, obviously my husband or my wife or my child is not doing well. They've got a little bit of a blue tinge. And um, then you find out that it's, it's nitrogen that you've been inhaling in that, in the wrong form. Surely our air has a lot of nitrogen in it, but yeah, it's really hilarious. But I really did, I, I like the idea of this making us and encouraging us to be more thoughtful, to be more mindful about the ways and the things that we, we would not take notice of. And I want you all to think about the fact that most people, and you all are going to hear me say this often as well, most people are not sitting down saying, I'm going to destroy the lagoon this weekend. I'm going to buy 15 things of fertilizer. I'm going to spread it all out. It's going to be great. My dastardly plan is going to work. No one is saying that. There isn't anyone that I know of who has grandchildren that says, I don't care if there's a better world, a better environment, a more sustainable life for him or her. They're, people are just not actively thinking like that. You know what they're saying? I want my turf to look healthy. I want my plants to, to flower and, and, and bloom out. Those are the things that people are really doing, okay? And I'm telling you all these things because we think about these things and we're gonna be thinking about them more mindfully now, hopefully, at least one thing off of that list will have stuck with you. But there are so many people that we're going to engage with have not had an opportunity to stop and say 5,500 square feet in my lot taking away my house and my carport but geez I only have 7,000 square feet left to work with I'm going to save $60 by not buying all this extra fertilizer and my grandkids will be able to go out there and play in two days without it becoming an issue lots of people don't think about these things they don't have the point of view that we currently are developing or we already have, right? And they don't have the answer. Like, 
well, what is she looking at? I'm like, I'm looking at what you're looking at. Yeah, just, you <laughs> I know, just have to use double screen to cover this. One camera. <laughs> so that's all we got to work with. Uh. Okay. So welcome to class, Sierra. Um, Sierra is one of our wonderful um, master's students over at the Florida Medical Entomology Lab that we have here in Indian River County. It's off Oslo Road, um, just east of US-1. So at first it was the mosquito research facility and now it's medical entomology because we realized that we engage with more and more insects medically than just mosquitoes. And that was already an established place and it's really, really great. Mm -hmm. um, Sierra, thank you so much for giving us, what is it has been now, three or four years of your I think, well, I, I think this is my fourth, third or fourth presentation, but since 2019, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So she has really, really been great about helping me train master gardeners on insects. It's not my favorite subject. Hence, Sierra assisting with this task. <laughs> I'm very grateful. All right, so um, you all should have your handouts of the lecture, and then you all have the handouts for the activities as well, um, and the assessment for afterwards. The activities and assessment are not nearly as important as being able to take notes while Sierra gives the lecture. Yeah. Okay? So just grab the one stack with the slides and the notes to the side. All right, and going around the room, I'll tell you that I've got eight students in here. Okay. So that, and I'll send you the rest of your numbers breakdown so that you can put it in your report. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Take it away. All righty. So this is module 12 for you guys. So I've been told, let me see. Let me make sure I can switch slides now. There we go. Okay, these are your lesson objectives. You have them printed out before you. So this is something just to keep in mind as we're going through this. These are probably, I'm assuming, with what how Nikki has prepared the course is the big ideas that you wanna keep track of while we're going through the lecture today. So insects evolved on land over 300 million years ago. So they have had a place on our earth for quite some time. A fun fact is actually, I don't know if I said this last year, but this is actually pretty cool. Um, insects back 300 million years ago were actually quite large because the concentration of oxygen in the atmosphere was about 34% and today it's about 21%. And you're gonna learn how insects breathe and why they're a lot smaller now because of that. But your standard dragonfly was probably about this big back in like the Cretaceous period. So that's pretty cool. So insects are in the phylum Arthropoda. They, this means jointed leg in Latin. This phylum is made up of six classes, of, one of which are insects, and they are dubbed the insecta. So notice that spiders, mites, and ticks are not insects. They are Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> they are arachnids in the class Arachnida, and they have their own separate thing. So insects and arachnida completely separate from each other. So before we get into the class, let's talk about the features that define and separate the arthropods from other phyla, such as those representing the mollusks and the worms. So there are seven characteristics that are shared among all arthropods, the first having a segmented body, The second is that all arthropods have jointed legs that come in a pair. This basically means that each segment of the leg is connected by a joint, and typically this is a hinge joint, kind of like those we see in our elbows. The third is that all arthropods have a chitinous exoskeleton. This is part of the insect that is shed during a molting period. An example you might be familiar with are all the dull brown casings of cicadas on the side of trees or on the ground. There's a lot around here in Florida, not as much where I'm from, which is California. So you'll see like these little crusty um, sheddings, which are the exoskeletons of 
the insects or arthropods in general. So the fourth characteristic of arthropods is the presence of a digestive system. So note that this is an illustrative representation of only one type of insect with a specific diet. The size of the different sections of the digestive system in general can vary greatly between insects. And it's a general rule of thumb is that most digestive tracts are within the abdominal region of an arthropod. So that would be usually the back half of it, but as you can see in the grasshopper, it takes up the entire body. So this is just a general representation. The fifth characteristic is that arthropods have an open circulatory system. Whereas our blood is confined in veins and arteries, insect blood, which is called hemolymph, flows three, freely throughout the body. The brown highlighted area in this illustration is the primary body cavity for circulation. Insects do have what we would consider to be a heart along with the vessels along their dorsal side, which if you think of dorsal, it's like dorsal fin of a dolphin, so that'll be our backside, which has um, a contraction function like to pump the hemolymph throughout the insect, which is kind of like a heart. So in this um, pictograph, the aorta would be like the heart. The sixth defining characteristic of all arthropods is the ventral nervous system. So I just, we talked about dorsal, which is the back. The ventral is gonna be like our sternum area. Um, it is concentrated on the ventral face of the insect and is a system of ganglia and nerves. Ganglia are basically bundles and masses of nerves. And the biggest one is located in the head, which is what we call the brain. So like how our nervous systems, the brain, and then a whole bunch of like little extensions throughout our body, they have masses of large ganglia, which is just nerve masses throughout their body. The final general defining characteristic of all arthropods is that their respiratory system is made up of gills or trachea and spiracles. Of course, the gills are only seen in organisms with aquatic life stages. So they're not gonna be in like a grasshopper. They have trachea and spiracles. So trachea and spiracles are the dominant system involving the exchange of air from outside of the body to the inside of the body. The spiracles are in direct contact with the air and they often have an open and closing mechanism. The tracheal system is quite intricate. So the spiracle, you can think of, it's like a hole in your body. Let's think of it as our ear. The, it opens and closes to let air in. And then the tracheal system are tubes that are connected to the spiracle that go into the body. And it covers throughout the, the entire insect body. And these tubes, these tracheals split up into even small, trachea split up into smaller and smaller and smaller tubes, which are tracheoles. And actually, they branch off in, in the bottom left image, you can see here that they go within the muscles and each one of these even smaller broken off branches of tracheals will try to get as close to the mitochondria inside individual cells as possible. So it's a really intricate system of how they get oxygen to every single cell and muscle in their body. So as mentioned previously, all arthropod phylum is made up of six classes. This is the crustacea class, which contains organisms like shrimp and crab, and the pill bug, which is not a pill bug, is a crustacean. <laughs> um, these three classes, the chylopods, dilopods, and symphyla, are also known as myriapods. I learned them as myriapods, so recently they have like chopped them up into these three classes. So myriapods in general are the centipedes and the millipedes. The arachnida, like we mentioned earlier, is the class containing organisms with eight legs and no antenna, which is unlike insects, as you will see. And they most often have one to two body segments, not three. So spiders, mites, scorpions, ticks. So finally, the hot topic of the day, the insecta. The insecta class itself has a list of defining characteristics, which I'll get into in a second. So we went through the defining characteristics of all arthropods, which is the phylum. And then we talked briefly about all the other classes. Now we're gonna talk about the specific characteristics of the insecta class, which differentiates them from all the other ones. 
So insects are the most diverse group of animals on the planet, totaling more than 1 million species of insects in the world, making up at least half of the total animal species on Earth combined. Florida is highly subject to the introduction of new species because of its tropical and subtropical system and the large scale of importation traffic from many regions. So that's why it's pretty important in this area that we learn more about insects. So of all the species in the world, less than 1% are considered a pest. So thank gosh for that. So how do you know when the insect of in if interest is actually a pest or not? So it starts with the anatomy of an insect. All insects have three body segments, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. The thorax contains three pairs of legs, so six legs, and most insects will have one or two pairs of wings also located on the thorax. Insects have one pair of antenna located on their head. They also have a single pair of compound eyes, which are like awesome eyes, and they also have one to three simple eyes, which are known as ocelli. They're mostly just like light reception. They don't really see image or produce image. So this is from above. As in this picture, the legs can sometimes appear on insects as though they arise from different parts of the body, but they all originate right here in this center segment, the thorax, which is important to keep in mind, and so do the wings. So the head, it functions mainly for feeding and sensory perception, the mouth parts and the eyes. The thorax is responsible for locomotion. As we said, it contains three segments, and that's where the legs arise. So the thorax itself is the middle segment of the entire insect and the thorax is broken up into three smaller segments. The legs take up each segment, each of the three segments of the thorax and the wings are on the last two segments of the thorax. The abdomen is responsible for excretion and reproduction. And insects can be grouped by their type of mouth parts. So chewing, piercing, sucking, siphoning, and sponging, also known as lapping. Um, these groupings are useful when we don't have the insect to refer to and you're trying to make deductions about your plant damage just from the plant damage and you don't have an insect specimen to actually look at. So with chewing insects, it's common to see asymmetrical pieces of the plant missing, starting from the outermost point of the plant tissue and moving inward along the edge. However, there are some specialized insects that have chewing mouth parts that only feed between the leaf veins. So skeletonizing and window feeding, this is also done by insects with chewing mouth parts. Here are some insects that have chewing mouth parts that may be responsible for some plant damage. Those are caterpillars, grasshoppers, and beetles. So insects with piercing, sucking mouth parts are the most common form of transmission for plant pathogens. So chewing mouth parts usually cause physical damage to plants and insects with these piercing, sucking mouth parts usually are responsible for things like discoloration because they're affecting the plant in different ways. Also fruit damage too. With siphoning insects, such as Lepidoptera, with their moths and butterflies, their proboscis acts like a straw to draw up liquids. Usually not pests, but you know. Um, and then the sponging or lapping mouth parts are seen in dipterin, which are the flies. And they are less clean and precise as piercing sucking mouth parts. Instead, they more tear and puncture and then let liquid pool so that they can lap it up. Um, usually this is what like fruit flies would do on fruits and stuff, but even like horse flies that bite people and stuff, that's what they do. They kind of just like smash their mouth into you to cut you and then they'll lap up the blood instead of nicely piercing you like a mosquito or something. So next is understanding the growth and developmental stages of insects. This is very important when diagnosing a problem. This is because different stages of the insect occupy different areas of the plant. They cause different forms of damage, and in many cases, one stage may be a pest stage, while the other life stage is not a pest. So like caterpillars are a pest on plants, but butterflies, their adult stage, are not. 
So you want to make sure that we can understand their life cycle, their different stages, the different habitats that they have during these different life stages. And knowing which insects have different life stages is important too. So when making decisions about controlling insects, it is also critical to account for which stage that you're aiming to control. With that being said, there are two types of growth patterns in insects, that is incomplete metamorphosis and complete metamorphosis. So incomplete metamorphosis is when the egg hatches into what appears to be a smaller and less developed version of the adult and it just grows larger and develops slowly into adult over each molt. So these are seen in the milkweed bugs and in cockroaches, also crickets and orthoptera, stuff like that. Um, in this case, the nymphs and adults often occupy the same habitats and eat the same foods. So they are competing with each other. So if you see a nymph cockroach, you know that there's probably going to be adult cockroaches in the same area causing the same problems. So you know that when you're treating for an insect that has this incomplete metamorphosis, that you're going to be targeting all life stages because they're all a problem on your plant or whatever, or your property or anything. So complete metamorphosis is when the insect undergoes a much more dramatic development from egg to larva then from a larva to a pupa, and then from a pupa to an adult. And a pupa is usually an inactive stage in most insects. It is often the case that the adult occupies a completely different niche than that of the larval stage, which is an evolutionary advantage to decrease intraspecific competition. So for butterflies, for example, the larvae are competing for resources on plants like plant tissue, and the adults are competing for resources in flower nectar. So they completely different parts of the plant, sometimes even completely different plants in general. So you want to know if we're trying to target larva ca caterpillars, you want to be able to target the plants that the caterpillars are on. And you also want to know more about the adults. That way you can target the adults in a different way because one strategy is not going to work for the other. So now that we've had a slight introduction to the major characteristics of insects, we can look more closely into each order of insects. As you can see, there are quite a few orders of insects. I actually did not list all of them here because some of them only include a few species they are just pretty irrelevant in general to what we consider pests and important right now. Um, they are all phenotypically very different from each other and it becomes very easy to recognize once you're familiar with the orders. So hopefully by the end of the day, you'll be able to differentiate things that you maybe weren't before. So these bolded orders are the ones that are most often considered pests of plants. That would be the Coleoptera, the Diptera, Hemiptera, Leptoptera, Orthoptera, and Thysanoptera. And I'll tell you the common names for all of these as we go through them individually. So if you want to star these, go ahead and do that. So the Blatodia is the cockroach order. Um, there has been some rec recent conversions in the classifications that um, cockroaches now include termites in this order, but for the purposes of this, we're going to keep them separate because that's how I was taught, but it probably doesn't matter to you, but just so you know. So I feel like everybody's pretty comfortable with what a cockroach looks like. They're flat, they got leathery forewings, and they're gross. So we'll move on from there. Um, the coleoptera, which are the beetles and the weevils, they have, you notice that they usually are really hard and tough. Those are actually their forewings that are hardened into a shell-like structure, which are called elytra. So that's a really key characteristic of beetles is they have this really tough exoskeleton and their front wings are just really tough too. Um, you can poke it and just makes a noise like like it's on plastic and stuff like that. And they all have chewing mouth parts. So they're usually pretty easy to see too as well. Um, these are the Dermaptera, which are the earwigs. They're, I feel like they are also pretty easy to differentiate from other things. I've noticed the ones here in Florida are huge and colorful, which are not like the ones from California, at least that I've ever seen. So they are pretty easy to differentiate. They have this huge cirque on the end of their abdomen. 
So um, you, you usually won't get them confused with the beetle because you can see that their abdomen is pretty exposed. And even though they have hardened like leathery elytra like the beetles, they're not as tough and they're a lot shorter. So um, this is a diptera. So this includes flies, midges, mosquitoes, and gnats. Um, what's interesting about diptera is that their second pair of wings are evolutionarily reduced to what we call haltiers. This actually helps them balance and this is why they're such great flyers. When you try to swat them, of course, they always get away. And this is the reason why. <laughs> they're just a lot more adapt to flying better than a lot of insects. Um, so flies either have piercing and sucking mouth parts or they have those sponging and lapping ones. They don't have chewing mouth parts and they don't have the long tongues like Lepidoptera do. Um, the hemiptera are a little bit more broad and a little bit more hard to differentiate from other insects, so I tried to encompass what I could for these. Um, the hemiptera can be separated into a couple fairly distinguishable suborders. So all these suborders I'm going to go through, they're all collectively in the order hemiptera, which most people define as bugs in general, actually only like applies to the hemiptera order. Beetles are not bugs, so that's just something to keep in mind as well. Um, heteroptera are known as the true bugs. These are, I see these a whole bunch around here too, leaf-footed bugs and like um, little lace bugs. You can, they have these leathery, you can still see the veins on their wings for these insects, but they have like half of their wings are pretty leathery. So that's one way to distinguish these from other hemiptera, but at the, at the end of the day, like the next couple slides I'm going to show you, they're all part of the same order. So these are the Akinarinka. Um, they are more like the leaf hoppers, the plant hoppers, the cicadas and stuff. Their face is kind of folded in this triangular like way, and their mouth is actually on the bottom. So it's kind of distinguishable. You can see here, these their heads are just a lot more triangular and narrow and differentiated. These ones have just weird triangly flat heads. And uh, you, yeah, you can see that here, the difference between the heteroptera, the true bugs, and then the akinarinka. Um, the final one is the uh, sternarinka, which are the white flies, psyllids, aphids, scales, and mealybuds. These, um, these are all pretty important on pests, so, or as pests for plants. So this, these are the suborder, the Sternarinka. We're gonna go through a lot more of these a little bit later in depth because they're more relevant to you than the other bugs. The Hymenopteran order contains bees, wasps, sawflies, and ants. Um, I feel like we all are pretty familiar with what bees and wasps look like. They're scary looking and most wasps had that really thin pinched waist and then they have like a dipped stinger at the end of it usually. Um, their immature stages are all larvae. They all look like maggots. So um, these are the isoptera, which are the termites. They are pests in their own way, of course, not all the time. They don't always have wings, usually just when it's reproductive season. Um, they're all soft bodied, pretty grubby like and they have chewing mouth parts and they don't have eyes, they're blind. So they're also use social insects, which is pretty interesting, kind of like bees, they're pretty social. The Lepidopterans, who doesn't love the Lepidopterans, the butterflies and the moths. These are all the adult stages, but for you, the pest stage is gonna be the immature caterpillar stage, so. And they have chewing mouth parts as caterpillars. These are the mantids, the mantodia. I guess these could be kind of confused with stick bugs, but these guys usually always have their um, front legs. They're, they call it raptoral. So they're always just like out and bent like this. That's usually how you can distinguish them. They also got big old bug eyes and they have chewing mouth parts. So they, I guess the adults are pests on some plants like leaf tissue. The neuropterans, 
These are the lace wings and the antlions. Their wings are always very, very membranous and see-through with a whole bunch of tiny veins. So sometimes that's how you can tell them apart from other insects, just like Heteroptor, Heteroptera or the other little bugs that we were talking about. Um, their eggs are on little stalks. This is for the green lace wing. So it's, we're gonna talk about these later and why they're actually beneficial. So it's good to be able to know what their eggs look like. Cause that means that you know that they're in your garden or area. And the larvae and adults are usually predaceous, usually on pests, so that's why they're a good insect. We'll talk about that. The odonata are the dragonflies and the damselflies. Dragonflies are a little more stout. They're the ones you see in parking lots all the time. Damselflies are little skinny, dainty guys, and they're usually more next to bodies of water or low on grass. And they have chewing mouth parts, and they're predaceous as adults and as larvae. The Orthopteran are the grasshoppers, crickets, katydids, and mole crickets. Um, I feel like everyone kind of knows Orthoptera in general. I feel like it's obviously harder to distinguish a grasshopper from a katydid from a cricket, but they all have, you know, jumping hind legs and they have more like leathery forewings. These are the stick bugs, as you can see. They are different from the mantids because their head is just a lot less distinguishable. They don't have the big old bug eyes that the mantids have, and also they don't have those raptorial front legs that are always kind of up and bent that the mantids have. And they also have chewing mouth parts. Uh, the Socoptera, which are like book lice and bark lice, they're not really, there might be a pest of like libraries, not really you guys, but um, they're not really important to distinguish, but they have like this bulbous on their nose that if you were to look under a microscope, that would be like a key characteristic of what is this tiny insignificant creature? Oh, it has a bulbous on its nose. It's probably a book lice. The Siphonoptera, which are the fleas, gross. They're laterally flattened, so they're flattened this way. And that, that's the opposite of lice, which are flattened this way because lice are trying to like stay on our body or in our hair. So by being flattened this way, they can have more contact. Fleas are the opposite. They're like this because they're on animal fur. So they're trying to go, you know, it's a whole different thing. Um, they're not horticulturally significant, but just so you know. And then finally, Thysanoptera, which are the thrips, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with and hate. Um, they will get real familiar with them. No, I'm sure. <laughs> they have... Um, they have modified mouth parts that punch and suck. They don't really like pierce, but they also don't lap. So it's like a dull needle, pretty much, I guess I would say. Small, slender, soft bodied. Okay, so I've brought up insects as pests, but not all insects are pests, as you'll see. Some, of course, are beneficial, and we use insects for many reasons. When we think of beneficial insects, we often think of pollinators and insects that are natural enemies, serving as a form of biological control against insect crop pests. However, many insects are also decomposers, and they are also important in environmental maintenance. They are also insects that are used for medicinal purposes, the most underrated, in my opinion, being the flesh-eating maggots, which only feed on dead tissue. This is actually used for diabetic patients with chronic ulcers, so it's pretty cool. Um, there's, and they could do a better job than most surgeons, you know, not just not even getting a live cell from a dead cell. I mean, they really differentiate. It's pretty amazing. Um, there's also some literature on the anti-inflammatory properties of bee venom being used with injection as acupuncture techniques in arthritis patients. So that's pretty cool. We also consider insects beneficial when they serve as products or producers of goods. In many regions of the world, insects are a staple component of people's diet pretty much everywhere except for like America and Europe, just like pretty much everywhere else. They also create everyday products. We use like honey, beeswax, silk, shellac, and color dyes, not to mention that there's like 65 to 70 million pounds of silk that is produced annually from mass reared silk moths. So there are a lot of beneficial insects that we use. Um, a little bit more specifics about the examples of beneficial insects. Um, pollination, decomposition, aerating the soil, biological control of weeds, providing food, med medical purposes, blah, blah, blah. We went over that. 
Um, I'm gonna go into some specific orders now and some specific examples in those orders of insects that are beneficial for you horticulturally. Um, ladybugs, for example, are more properly referred to as lady beetles because as you will see, they are in Coleoptera, which is the beetles. And we learned today that bugs are Heteroptera. So they are important predators that feed on many insects that we consider pests, including aphids, mites, scales, mealybugs, thrips, whiteflies, yada, yada. They are great general predators. So if you're trying to get one specific thing off your plant, you know, it's not gonna be a specified predator. It's gonna eat every one of these little things. So always helpful. Lace wings are another great predator. You can easily know if you have this beneficial predator in your garden if you see these tiny eggs on these thread stalks. That's what I was pointing out earlier. It's just a key indication that if you're introducing them into your garden that you know that it's taken because they're reproducing in your plants. Or if you have them here, you know, you know that you are getting some biological control here. They're less general than um, the ladybugs, but obviously still help. The brown lace wings are just as useful. They don't have their eggs on stock, so it's harder to determine if they're actually there. And also I should mention that the adult version of this insect and the larval version of this insect are both predaceous, which is like we were talking about when the larval and the adult are so different, sometimes they actually have these different life stages and are completely separate. But the lace wings are both predaceous on plant, on bugs, on plants. So they're helpful throughout their entire life, which is nice. Um, flower flies, I learned them as hover flies, are considered beneficial in that they are predators of aphids as larvae. And as adults, they are pollinators. So two for one with these guys. They eat aphids when they're larvae and then they go and pollinate for us. What more could we ask? The big-eyed bugs, they're a heteropteran, a true bug, are also predators. They feed on cinch bugs, which are a big problem in Florida here. Um, moth bugs, caterpillars, thrips, and mites. There's also the minute pirate bugs, which are another predator. They feed on white flies, leaf poppers, aphids, thrips, you know, all the guys we don't like. Um, they can be confused in appearance with the southern cinch bug. I've actually, this was like the first lecture I did for you, Nikki, I think, when I went over these guys. Yeah. Um, they, the cinch bug, I think they're a pest of grasses, namely like the St. Augustine grass. So if you, Correct. you know, you want to be able to differentiate your beneficial pirate bug from this pest um, cinch bug, which can be kind of hard as you can see. So some stink bugs are considered beneficial for controlling caterpillars and beetle larvae, but not all stink bugs are. And like many species of stink bugs, they can be damaging to plants. So it's always important to know which general species that you're dealing with. Luckily in this case, we can differentiate the green stink bug from its color, which is a pest, from the brown stink bug, which is a predator. Obviously, because, you know, stink bugs, like, they can be pests and predator, I wouldn't go to them for, you know, oh, I need some caterpillars controlled, I'm going to put a brown stink bug. You want to make sure that you know what you're putting in your garden. And, but just so you know, that they are beneficial sometimes. Um, the Hymenoptera, the parasitic wasps. These are really cool. So parasitic wasps are commonly used in biological control. They're one of the most successful things of biological control that we have, other than things like Wolbachia and bacterias. So their larvae infect the host and they kill it slower than a predator would, but they are often effective in population reduction over time. So with the predator, you have immediate control. You're killing the insect, removing it. It's no longer causing damage. Parasitic wasps is a little bit slower. The insect can continue to cause damage, but you're establishing a population, so it becomes worth it. Um, those are just so cool. So they do this on usually caterpillars, but beetle larvae, white flies, aphids, and mole crickets. Crazy. Finally, there are predatory mites that feed on thrips and other insects that could potentially be pests. 
So now we talked a little bit about some beneficial insects, usually predators. Now we're gonna talk about some pest insects that you can be aware of. So these are the white flies. Remember they are Hemiptera and Strinorinca. Uh, they have piercing sucking mouth parts. White flies are soft bodied. They are winged insects closely related to the aphids and the mealybugs. They're also often found in clusters on the underside of leaves. They are active during the daytime, so they are easier to spot than some other nocturnal pests. Um, they are also capable of overwintering and can reproduce throughout the entire year in warmer climates. White flies tend to suck on ornamentals and warm weather vegetable plants, including tomatoes, eggplant, peppers, and okra. They also like sweet potatoes and plants from the cabbage family. Uh, white flies suck plant juices and in turn produce a sticky substance known as honeydew. Honeydew left on its own can cause fungal diseases to form on leaves, which cause discoloration. Um, due to white fly feeding, plants will quickly become extremely weak and may be unable to carry out photosynthesis. That's no bueno for our plants. The leaves will wilt, turn pale or yellow, and the growth will be stunted. So white flies are a pain in the booty. Long story short. Um, oh yeah, here's the underside of the leaf picture. Whole bunch of them, they're always in clusters. Great. Uh, this is the fungus that I was talking, the um, honeydew turning into like a fungus. If you see this, white flies. Okay, aphids. Aphids are small, soft-bodied, pear-shaped insects that are frequently found in large numbers. Adult forms may be winged or wingless, depending on their stage of development during the season. Aphids secrete honeydew. Some aphid species serve as agents for plant diseases, such as virus mosaics. Um, females can reproduce without mating, known as parthenogenic reproduction, so they don't need no mans, which also makes it hard because now they're just reproducing whenever they want. Um, aphids attack nearly all species of plants. When leaves are attacked by aphids, damage often appears as a spotty yellow discoloration, usually on the underside of leaves. The leaves may dry out later and wilt. So the trend here underside of the leaves is usually where you're either identify damage or you're gonna find your pest insects. Aphids you can distinguish from these other tiny um, insects too by they have these three horns usually right on their butts and that's very ind indicative of aphids. Um, the corn ear slash tomato fruit worm. I learned it as the corn ear worm but apparently it's called a tomato fruit worm. Maybe you've heard it. First and second generation caterpillars attack the whorl stage and the later generations are largely found on ear corns. This is what some of the damage looks like. Uh, thrips. So there are around 5,000 species of thrips globally, which is insane because thrips are probably barely the size of your pinky nail in length. Um, oh yeah, I even have it written down right here. Their average size is 1.5 to 3 millimeters. That's like 1 25th of an inch. So uh, feeding by thrips may reduce seed production. It could disfigure flowers and fruits and damage plant leaves. Plant leaves may turn pale, splotchy, and silvery, and then they die. So injured plants are twisted, discolored, and scarred. I think a really common thing that I usually see is this bottom left picture, the silvering. Um, common host plants include onion, beans, carrots, squash, and many other garden vegetables, and many flowers, especially, um, you're gonna know how to say this better than I, any of you, gladioli, I think, and roses. Um, adults and larvae are responsible for spreading tomato spotted wilt virus, and um, narcotic spot, spot virus. So they also transmit viruses, which is great. Uh, the two-spotted spider mite. This pest is even smaller than the thrips. It's about 1 50th of an inch. On um, the spider mites feed by penetrating the plant tissue with their mouth parts and are found primarily on the underside of the leaf. 
Old spider mites spin a fine strand of webbing on the host plant, hence their name. The mites feeding causes graying or yellowing of the leaves. Um, neurotic spots occur when the advanced stages of leaf damage, so mites damage the open flower and cause browning and withering of petals that resemble a spray burn. And complete defoliation may occur if the mites are not controlled. They are one of the most economically important mites having been reported infesting over 200 species of plants. So I can't even give you a list here. They're everywhere. The scale insects, um, they usually cause damage similar to that of aphids. They are sap feeding by the scale insects uh, that may cause yellowing or wilting of leaves, stunting or unthrifty appearance of the plants and eventually death of all or just part of the plant when infestations are heavy. By that point, you'll usually be able to see all of them. They're not mobile really, so you should be able to know before a heavy infestation if you're actively looking. They also produce honeydew. Um, scale insects are difficult to control because of actually their structure. So they have this waxy, cottony covering that serves as a protective barrier to traditional contact insecticides. So I don't remember if I go over this later, but I'm gonna kind of say it now. Some insecticides that you use are contact insecticides. So when you're spraying them on your plant, you're wanting them to touch the external parts of the mosquito immediately. Some insecticides actually get taken up like by the plant like nicotines and stuff like that. And then when an insect feeds on the plant, that's how they're ingesting the insecticide and that's how it works. So those are the kinds that we're talking about here for scale insects that it's gonna be harder for contact ones to actually work on them. You actually need the ones that are drawn on by the plants. Okay, so speaking of control, integrated pest management is a highly pursued course of action for the control of many insects. It is a sustainable approach to manage pests by combining biological, chemical, cultural, and physical controls in a way that minimizes economic, health, and environmental risks. Basically, you want to use a whole bunch of different methods to reduce your reliance on one. Usually, the one that we're trying to reduce is chemical. Chemical is always helpful. It's always going to be necessary, but we want to at least reduce that as much as we can. So the five common practices of all integrated pest management programs are first, to monitor and scout for pests, to identify pests and or damage correctly, to set thresholds, to apply integrated pest management methods, and to evaluate the integrated pest management program. So monitoring traps are commonly used in monitoring efforts. Um, there was a lot of information for which traps are used for attracting specific insects. For example, bowl traps and vein traps are commonly used to survey bees. Um, they often are found in the color yellow and blue. Blue traps will catch different types of bees than yellow traps. So this is just one small example. There are a ton of different traps. If you are looking for a specific insect, you can find a trap that is known to attract them. Obviously, it's always better to look at research papers rather than some website, but you could do whatever you can do. Uh, this is an example of an integrated pest um, management survey record sheet. You also need to be able to identify the pests, which hopefully today, you know, we've worked on step two, so hopefully that's helped a little bit. Or the damages, if you don't have the pest there to see, you can at least make some deductions like the silvering of the petal. We know sometimes thrips cause. Step three, setting thresholds. So for horticulture, I know that there's and for agriculture, I know that there's aesthetic thresholds and then there's also econo economic thresholds. So aesthetic thresholds are levels at which management of a pest is initiated based on plant appearance. And economic thresholds are the number of pests present that prompt a control measure to prevent significant crop loss or damage. So according to these different thresholds, usually economic thresholds will have more um, give than an aesthetic 
threshold would have because you can have, you know, you can aesthetically have some uglier crops and they're still actually economically producible. So, and cultural control is such a crazy and vast topic. I'm going to try my best to just sum it up here with the importance little pieces of it. So cultural com control is basically the effort of making the environment less favorable for the pest. Um, it is usually by using crop and or other techniques of environmental modification and manipulations like plowing, planting, harvesting, and so forth, like intercropping, if you know what that is. Um, the right fertilizer can keep plants health and shorten the young susceptible plant growth stage. So if you're using a high-end fertilizer that has what your specific plant needs, sometimes it's worth investing because you've shortened that young susceptible stage of the plant. So it's less likely to be infested when it's more vulnerable. And usually when plants are older and more hardy, they're a whole lot harder for insects to infest. So stuff like that would be considered cultural control. Um, it can promote good root system too, using the proper fertilizer and maximize the expression of some chemical resistance factors that plants already have in them biologically. Irrigation is a common practice that can easily wash off small pests like aphids. And companion planting represents just one of the many areas in which a single farmer can incorporate diversifying schemes to reduce pest density in an infield approach. So that's like intercropping or putting plants that um, are attractive to beneficial insects that we know are predacious on pests of a plant right next to it. So stuff like that. And then there's biological control we've talked a little bit about. Um, it has been favored on and off for a while now because it can be very species specific. It is non-polluting and it can be very cost effective there's also less ch lesser chance of promoting the development of resistance as there are in other things like chemical control. However, it is a very slow acting method. Um, predators, parasitoids, nematodes, bacteria like Wolbachia and fungi like are all biological control because they are living organisms used to control other living organisms. There's conservative biological control, classical and Inoculative, they're not worth going into right now. Um, I would say inoculative is like predators immediately. You know, you're might, you're, you can release a whole bunch of predators. They're probably maybe not going to establish a population. It's probably going to die eventually, but it's a quick response. Establishment would be um, you're actually trying to make the environment favorable to those beneficial insects over a long period of time. And classical is mostly like nematodes, bacteria, parasitoids, stuff like that. Uh, physical control, so removing the pests by hands, by monitoring for eggs and hand picking them or dropping them into soapy waters. You know, more these are more like for the big ones, like grubs and stuff or caterpillars, or you can just actually grab them off your plant and discard them instead of having to use a massive amount of chemicals to kill this massive insect. Um, removing infested parts of plants, and step, which is mostly to help without spreading diseases of the plants, right? Or having other insects be infected by infected plant material, you would wanna stop that in its tracks. Um, establish a barrier to prevent pest access to plants. Next is chemical control. Uh, you always wanna use the least toxic product that will manage the pest. You use selective chemicals rather than broad spectrum chemicals. Usually if you can find a chemical that targets a certain type of insect or has a certain type of targeting, you want to do that more than just like a broad one, but you do what you got to do sometimes. Um, timing, this is pretty important. I think I brought this up a little bit earlier, only treating the insects vulnerable life stage. So if the insect is a pest as a larva, you don't want to spray the insect right when it's about to become an adult. You want to figure out the seat, the timing of the season when their eggs are hatching or and then spray them when they're at their smallest, most vulnerable life stage, which is the youngest larval stage, stuff like that. Um, spot treating, so that way you're not treating your, your entire crop or garden. You see where you have an infestation, you target that one hard 
and usually that you know it just keeps everything confined and of course because this is integrated pest management you want to include this effective method with other methods so when using pesticides you always want to follow recommendations and follow all label directions and i think yep that's it there's this little thing I don't think we got to it last time we did this. I don't even know if there's enough time. You what? have enough time. Okay. So here- They, they don't have the matching thing, but it'll be good for them to see. Oh, to like, yeah, that's fine. I have the answers in the next slide. Yeah. Which I'll pull up for myself. So I guess we're matching the larval state, like you're matching the immature stage which could either be egg or larva or nymph to the adult stage, which is on the left. So number one, this is the green lacewing. The one thing to remember about them is that they lay their eggs on stalks and that's how we know if they've established or can they're beneficial to us, they're the predators. So number one goes with D. Number two is the lady beetle. I don't think I showed you a picture of a larval lady beetle, but it is good to know because if you see them, you don't want to get rid of them. So number two goes with A. This is what a, a lady beetle larva looks like. They're black and spotted. They're not a caterpillar, so you want to keep them. They're not a beetle grub. Well, they are a beetle grub, but they're a good one. Um, three, I think this is the, the cinch buck or the pirate buck. See, look, I can't even differentiate. Oh, yeah. Well, it says three goes with E. I didn't make this key, by the way. <laughs> but yeah, it says three goes with E. I don't actually, I think that's the pirate bug. Eating an aphid, yeah, okay. Um, number four, that's a wasp. The grub of the wasp is C. Like, I think I mentioned this earlier, if you go through your slides, the wasps just look like grubs. All of their larvae do, it's so gross. And then number five is just Coleoptera. It's a beetle, a generic beetle. It looks like it's being predacious on something here. Um, the last one is B, that's a beetle larva. You could, it looks a little different than the other ones. First, like different than the wasp one. The wasp is a grub, a maggot. It doesn't have any legs. Number five to number B, they match because you could see it has hardened legs as a larva, which is pretty unique of beetles. They also have like really hard heads as larva with beetles. So there's that too. Oh yeah, these are the answers. And I think that's, I think that's it. Some acknowledgements. Um, Yeah. Do you all have any questions for Sierra? That was a lot. It is a lot. It is a whole lot. Last year I ended up getting questions long 